I, John Smith, being of sound mind and memory, do make, publish, and declare the following to be my last will and testament. Now these are words that may be greeted with anticipation or even dread, but for sure they are not words that will be ignored because people know the power of a last will and testament. By means of a man's will, he can control the living from the grave, so to speak. The Bible talks about wills. At Proverbs 13.22, it says that one who is good will leave an inheritance to sons of sons. Interesting. And lawyers tell us that these days the best way to make sure that that inheritance materializes is to have a legal will. Now, a will can provide an inheritance and it can do the opposite. A will can be a parting shot from the grave, a way to punish, a way to inflict pain upon the living. Well, either way, we may feel the odds of our being mentioned in a will seem quite remote. Most of us don't have that proverbial rich uncle. But actually, you are involved in a will. You are involved in the disposition of a last will and testament that was uttered 3,600 years ago. This will involve the passing on not of material goods. That's not what interests God's people. It was the passing on of something of far greater value. Do you know what that is, young people? The blessing of Jehovah. That is what makes rich. Well, how could that will affect us today? What does it mean for us in our lives? What can we learn from it? Well, in answer, we're going to turn back the clock. We're going to go back to the year 1711 BCE to a portion of Egypt called the land of Goshen. And there a man nearly 147 years of age dwells. His name is Jacob. Now we might remember Jacob as the man that loved sacred things, unlike his brother Esau. And his love for spiritual things caused a rift between him and his brother. In fact, for 20 years, Jacob lived in exile because he got that blessing that the seed, the Christ, would come through him. Years later, Jehovah told him to return back to the Canaan land. That meant confronting this brother Esau. And somehow, through Jacob's humility, he managed to reconcile with his brother. But now his life wasn't over. Now he had to settle make money, have children, grow into a nation. And now, by a series of coincidences and circumstances that were rather extraordinary, this man found himself out of that promised land, down in the land of Egypt. And by a series of circumstances, his son Joseph had been sent ahead and become the second most powerful man in the land. There, Jacob and his family prospered yet again, but now with this old age, year of 147 years of age, he now sends a message throughout the land of Goshen. And apparently the message was short and simple. It was sent to his 12 sons and it said, Your father is dying. What would they do? Well, hastily, these 12 sons would make their way to their father's residence, one by one arriving, but apparently... Or it would seem they were frightened by the pall of death. For some reason they seemed to hover at the doorway and not come in. But this old man sums up enough strength to sit up. He wraps his gnarled fingers around his old walking staff for support. He squints in the dim light and he smiles. He counts them. All twelve of his son have arrived. He doesn't want them to stand outside staring in. He says, come in. Look at Genesis chapter 49 verse 1. Mark your Bibles there because we're going to spend a lot of time in this chapter. It says, later on, Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together. Come on in, gather around. Gather around my deathbed together that I may tell you what will happen to you in the final part of the days. Assemble yourselves and listen, you sons of Jacob. Yes, listen to Israel, your father. And no doubt that's exactly what those sons did. They came in, they gathered around, perhaps standing in birth order, with the oldest son closest to Jacob. Now, did you notice something peculiar about the way Jacob spoke? Very peculiar way of speaking. He used poetry. Now, not the kind of poetry you learned in school where things rhyme. He used a form of poetry called Hebrew parallelism, in which words don't rhyme, but thoughts rhyme. They parallel. Now, notice, for example, the parallel between gather yourselves together, assemble yourselves together. 
you sons of Jacob, sons of Israel, your father. This is a style you'll see throughout this whole chapter. Well, all right, it's a piece of poetry, it's a will. Why should I care? Why did I come out on a Saturday night to hear about this? Did you notice that it said, let me tell you what will happen in the final part of the days, or as one translation puts it, in the days to come? That means that this will would have a small fulfillment, a literal fulfillment upon Jacob's sons, but the real fulfillment would be in the last days on spiritual Israel, and also it would be fulfilled on the great crowd. Now, you know what that means? It means you're in the will. You are one of the beneficiaries of the will. So the question is, what blessings does that will hold out for you? And what do you have to do to get those blessings? Well, if you were told your name was mentioned in a will, to be at a lawyer's office on a certain date, you'd be there, right? And you'd hope you're the first one named. You'd figure you'd get the most money. <laughs> well, everybody would look at Reuben as the firstborn, no doubt the one standing closest to his dying father, he had reason to expect blessings. As firstborn, he would get what is called the double portion. All of the children would get something. But the firstborn would get twice as much. Now, some of our kids may say, that's not fair. Well, yes, it is. It is fair. Because the firstborn would become the head of the family. And he would need that money. He would need those resources to care for the family responsibilities. But there was something more involved than that. You see, Jacob had received the blessing. The Christ, the Messiah, would come through him. And that meant that the seed that would bless all the families of the earth would come through one of those 12 sons. And logically, that would be the privilege of the firstborn. So he had the privilege of becoming the family priest, the privilege of having the Christ, the Messiah, come through his lineage. He should have been happy, but he wasn't. Reuben must have been a very, very worried man. Do you know why? He was a man with a secret. Keep your Bibles marked there and go back 50 years in time to Genesis 35, 22. 50 years ago. Here we read. And I'd like you young people particularly to note this. It says, It came about while Israel was tabernacling in that land that once Reuben went and lay down with Bilhah his father's concubine. Now can you imagine that? Reuben had sex with his father's wife or concubine. Do you know what makes this so devastating? Look at the top of the page. Look at the running head. What does it say? Death of Rachel. Can you imagine that? Jacob's beloved wife had just died. He was grieving. He was coming to terms with all this sadness. And what does his son do? commits fornication with his concubine. Can you imagine the, not only the callous insensitivity that that must have been, but the lack of respect for Jehovah's standards. Now, what would Jacob do? Notice the end of that verse. And Israel got to hear of it. Actually, that is one of the most chilling verses in the Bible. And Israel got to hear of it. And that's it. He didn't get mad. He didn't yell. He didn't do anything. A month went by. Six months went by. A year. Ten years. Twenty years. Thirty years. He did nothing. Reuben must have said, well, maybe the old man forgot all about it. Was he ever wrong? Back to Genesis chapter 49, verse 3. Now, if you're a parent, see if you can get the sense of how this father felt toward this son, all right? He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my vigor, and the beginning of my generative power, the excellence of dignity, the excellence of strength. Is there anybody that could read those verses and not feel this is a man that loved his son? It was his firstborn. He had a special feeling for him as his firstborn child. And he saw the potential in this child. Do you know what else? These words indicated two blessings. The excellence of dignity, the excellence of strength. That expression, the excellence of dignity, apparently refers to a future priesthood that could have come through the line 
of Reuben. And that expression, the excellence of strength, points to the Messiah's rule as king. The kingship would come through the line of Reuben. Or would it? Suddenly, decades of repressed rage explode from the lips of Jacob. Look at verse 4. With reckless license, like waters, do not you excel, because you have gone up to your father's bed. At that time, you profaned my lounge. And now something astonishing happens. So disturbed is Jacob that he makes a grammatical shift. He no longer speaks directly to his son, you. He switches to the third person, he. It says, he went up to it. Evidently, Jacob took his gaze off his guilty son as if he could no longer stand even to look at him anymore and addressed these words to his other son. He, he went up to it. It was as if to say, Reuben, you're my son. You were the one in whom my fondest hopes and dreams were centered. You were the one to whom I wanted to pass the blessing of Jehovah on to, and you have ruined everything by a disgusting act of sexual immorality. I can't even stand to look at you. What Reuben did, the Bible doesn't say. My guess is he probably collapsed into a heap of grief and cried like a baby. He had lost so much. Now, Jacob was not like some parents in the congregation who have found out about the wrongdoing of their children and tried to cover it over. No. Jacob held him 100% accountable and punished him. Now, what would the punishment be? He said, do not you excel. The New English Bible says, you will not excel. Yes, he had acted with reckless license like waters, unstable waters, like waters coming out of a dam that's about to break. He had ignored the consequences, and he said, because of this, you won't excel. Now, young people, please note this. Reuben was not executed for his sin. Isn't that interesting? He didn't take his life. What was the punishment? He lost not his life, but theocratic privileges. Yeah, there'd be a tribe. There was a tribe of Reuben. But there would be no king, no judge, no prophet, no leader that would come from the tribe of Reuben. It always was one of the least populous tribes. There would be no double portion, no priesthood, no Christ that would come through his lineage, no patriarchal privileges. He lost all of that. And you know what happens in the congregation today, young people? What breaks our heart is so many of our young ones have gotten involved in sexual immorality. Now, oftentimes, the elders, by means of using God's word, are able to help our young ones repent and not be disfellowshipped. However... What a tragedy it is when our young people lose out on theocratic privileges. Some have had to be removed as ministerial servants. Some have had to be removed as pioneers. And you know what a tragedy it is when a couple that have been engaged, and they're planning this beautiful wedding. Matter of fact, this happened not too long ago. Beautiful wedding planned. And one week before the wedding, the bride-to-be had to confess to the elders that they had committed fornication. And that meant they lost the privilege of getting married in the Kingdom Hall. And at the last minute, the best they could do was have the wedding outdoors in a park, and wouldn't you know it, it rained. It was such a devastating thing. It, it broke our hearts. Now, she didn't lose her life. He didn't lose his life because they were able to repent. But look at the privileges they lost. Here's what one young sister says. And she's talking from the heart to our young people. She says, I was one of those young people who fell into Satan's trap of having sex before marriage. I had bad feelings and guilt, all because of not obeying Jehovah. I had to be reproved. Now that's all over. Now I'm pioneering. But I pray to Jehovah that all the youth in his organization avoid the pain and suffering of not being obedient. Now, it does not have to happen to us. And here are some things that all of us, young or old, need to do if we're to avoid missing out on blessings, if we're to avoid the sin of Reuben. Number one, brothers and sisters, we all have to watch what we feed our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. 
And we know what that means, what we watch, what we listen to. We have to be very, very careful that we're not exposing ourselves to things that build up a desire for sexual immorality. Number two, if you're dating somebody, and you may even be in love, you may be engaged or about to be engaged. Now, when you love somebody, it's natural to want to touch them. We're not prudes. We're not against people showing affection. Yeah, you may want to hold her hand or what have you. you. At the end of the night, you don't want to go, well, it was nice being with you. But we've recommended that you set limits, set limits on expressions of affection. Okay, have some boundaries that you won't cross. Number three, yes, you can be affectionate, but avoid being alone in romantic situations. Avoid being alone in romantic situations. Now, you know what that means. There was a couple in our congregation, young brother, they were, they were engaged, and uh, he never was alone with her for one second. It, it almost was kind of comical at times, because we actually accidentally left them in the car alone for like 10 seconds. I didn't know the man could move so quick. He jumped out of that car. We've got to be chaperoned. Now, he didn't trust himself. And you know, at the time... I frankly thought he was a little bit fanatical, but let me tell you something. After having had all these couples confess to us either before the wedding or after the wedding, it was a beautiful thing to go to their wedding and to know, to know they were clean. And what wonderful privileges he and his wife enjoy to this day. Now, if we ever are in a situation where we're tempted to make the mistake of Reuben, Remember, he rushed headlong, didn't think of the consequences. Stop and think. Stop and think of the consequences. Perhaps it will protect you from losing out on blessings. Now, it probably was a few agonizing minutes before Jacob could compose himself enough to even speak again. Next to be addressed was the second oldest son, Simeon. Significantly, Jacob did not address him alone. And when he addressed him along with Levi, it indicated, uh-oh, this old man had a long memory. What do we mean by that? Look at verse 5 of Genesis 49. Simeon and Levi are brothers. One translation says they're two of a kind. Instruments of violence are their slaughter weapons. Into the intimate group do not come, O oh my soul. With their congregation do not become united, O oh my disposition. Because in their anger they killed men, and in their arbitrariness they hamstrung bulls. Cursed be their anger, because it is cruel, and their fury, because it acts harshly. Let me parcel them out in Jacob, and let me scatter them in Israel. Now, what was this talking about? Well, if you're an advanced Bible student, you know what he's referring to. He's referring to an incident that took place decades ago when they still lived in Canaan. Their sister, Dinah, had been raped by Shechem. Most of our young people know that from the Young People Ask video. She got raped, and instead of looking to their father to handle this, what did they do? They acted, as Jacob says, in their arbitrariness. They took the law into their own hands, and they decided to kill all the men of Shechem. Now this made Jacob's name a stench. It actually put their lives in danger. Because Jacob feared, well, the Canaanites would just come and wipe us out. We don't have enough people to fight this whole country. He was very, very angry. But once again, Jacob didn't kill them. They didn't lose their lives. What did they lose? Theocratic privileges. Both of them lost the privilege of the firstborn. No Christ, no Messiah would come through either Simeon or Levi. But interestingly, he did something else. They had teamed up together, and Jacob now saw to it they would never team up again. He says, let me scatter them. Let me break up your little teamwork. Let me parcel you out. Now, what does that mean? Well, you recall that 200 years later, when the Jews were about to go into the Promised Land, by lot, they decided where each tribe would live, right? Jehovah loaded the dice, so to speak. He made sure those lots came out in such a way that it would fulfill this prophecy. Now, significantly, a lot can happen in 200 years. And you know what happened in 200 years? By then, the tribe of Levi had lived down their father's mistake. 
In fact, by the days of Moses, it turns out that Levi actually was the most loyal tribe. When Israel offered up the golden calf and Moses said, Who was on Jehovah's side? Come to me. Who came to him? Do you remember? It was the tribe of Levi. So, he did not hold back from allowing that loyal tribe to have the blessing of the priesthood. So, although originally the kingship and the priesthood could have come from, through one person, it had been split up. One tribe would carry the priesthood. One tribe would carry the kingship. And these two things would not come together until Jesus Christ arrived on the earth and was anointed as both king and priest. Now, it worked out that the tribe of Levi did not receive a solid block of land. He scattered them by giving them cities throughout the nation. But you know what Jehovah did, which is rather interesting, in a way only Jehovah can do? He turned that curse into a blessing. How did he do that? Well, the Levites were now the teachers of God's law. And by scattering them, that meant everybody had access to a Levite. If you had a problem, if you had a question, a couple of miles away, a couple of blocks away, there was a Levite. That turned out to be a blessing for the whole country. Simeon likewise was scattered and received cities within the territory of Judah. In effect, he broke up that teamwork. Now, do we have Simeons and Levites today in the congregation? Said to say, yes, we do. Now, here's a news flash, brothers. Bad things happen. Bad things happen. Terrible things happen. Sometimes in the congregation, people get involved in, in disgraceful conduct. Now there's six million people in this organization. Six million. You know what that means? That among that six million, there are going to be some fornicators that have to be expelled. There will be some adulterers. There will be some thieves. There will be some child molesters. So these, these bad things do happen in the congregation. Sometimes the brothers handle it well. Sometimes the brothers don't handle it too well. Sometimes mistakes in, are made. Errors in judgment. It happens. It's life. The question is, what do we do when we see that a matter wasn't handled properly? At least we feel it wasn't handled properly. Will we wait on Jehovah? Or will we be like Simeon and Levi? We see brothers right now getting on the internet, going to the media... Saying, marching on Bethel, <laughs> protesting. Nonsense like this. That's the spirit of Simeon and Levi. And brothers, if anybody ever tries to get you to team up in what is clearly rebellion, have the strength to say, I want no part of this. Yeah, but those brothers messed it up. Well, maybe they did. Maybe they did. But you know, I'm just going to wait on Jehovah. I'll wait on Jehovah to straighten it out. That is the path that leads to blessing. Well, Reuben had lost. Simeon had lost. Levi had lost. Any volunteers to be next? Would you have liked to have been Judah? Not me. Poor Judah was next in line. And if ever there was a man who had reason to be nervous, it was Judah. Had not Judah joined Simeon and Levi when they annihilated Shechem? He was there. Had not Judah joined in hating Joseph? Remember that whole thing where they sold him into slavery and convinced their father that he was dead? Judah had been there. And this is very embarrassing. Had not Judah been seeking the services of a prostitute? when his own daughter-in-law tricked him into having sexual relations with her because he had failed to arrange for his deceased son to have an heir. This is embarrassing stuff, and it's there in the Bible. So the last man on this planet who's going to get a blessing is going to be Judah. And now you've got to go up to your father and to be told that. No doubt he approached that bed with trepidation. But look at Genesis 49, verse 8. As for you, Judah... Your brothers will laud you. Now, in Hebrew, this is a play on words. The word Judah means laud or praise. As for you, praise. Your brothers will praise you. What? Your hand will be on the back of the neck of your enemies. The sons of your father, your brothers, will prostrate themselves to you. A lion cub Judah is. From the prey, my son, you will certainly go up. 
He bowed down. He stretched himself out like a lion. And like a lion, who dares rouse him? The scepter will not turn aside from Judah, neither the commander's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him the obedience of the peoples will belong. Friends, do you know what probably happened in that room when those words were uttered? They probably went, <gasps> What? And everybody must have looked at Joseph. Everybody must have looked at Joseph. Now think of this, friends. Joseph is one of the only major Bible characters about whom nothing bad is said. Can you think of anything bad about Joseph? I can't. When he was tempted with fornication, he ran. He was full of love, not hate. Jehovah blessed him to be the second most powerful man in Egypt. Surely he would be the one that Jehovah would use for the lineage of the Christ. And Judah with his past, surely Jehovah wouldn't use a man like that. But he did. But he did. Shiloh. And Shiloh means he to whom it belongs. That's the Messiah. He to whom it belongs, the kingship. To whom, to whom it, he to whom it belongs. Shiloh would come through Judah. And Joseph, remember in his dreams how the sun and the moon and the stars bowed to him. Now Joseph would have to turn around and he'd have to submit to the tribe of Judah. In fact, Judah would become so prominent that all of the descendants of Jacob would be named after Judah. That's why we call them Jews. The word Jew comes from Judah. Why in the world did Jehovah give all those blessings to Judah? I haven't the slightest idea. Not a clue. Uh, the Bible does not tell us. Now, I've read the Genesis account over and over again, and I've tried to find some good in Judah. And you really got to work at it. And you go, what? what did Jehovah see in this man? Yet at First Chronicles 5, verse 2, the Bible says that Judah himself proved to be superior among his brothers. Now, exactly how he proved to be superior is not clear. But there is one line of reasoning that appears to hold true. It is true that Judah joined in hating Joseph, but apparently as the years passed, and brothers, please take note, as the years passed, the man changed. Now, what indicates that he changed? Do you remember what Joseph did when his brothers came down to Egypt, that he was number two in command, they didn't recognize him. And Joseph says to himself, how do I know these men have changed? How do I know they're still not full of hate? Now they thought Joseph was dead. And so that would have now made Benjamin the favorite son. Maybe they hate him the way they hated me. Let me test them. I'll say, okay, you can go back, but let me throw your brother Benjamin in jail. Now the old Judah would said, yeah, throw that brat in jail. Let him rot. Right? That's the way they treated Joseph. But do you remember the Bible says in Genesis 44 that Judah spoke up. And Judah said, how can I go up to my father without the boy along with me? For fear that then I may look upon the calamity that will find out my father. Well, this was a different man. This was the same man that watched his father cry his eyes out, thinking his son was dead, and just callously let his father suffer. But now years later, it's a different man. He had changed. He had a heart now. And he said, I, I can't do this to my father. Brothers, do we credit people with the ability to change? Do we really believe that if somebody applies himself and allows Holy Spirit to work on him, do we really believe people can change? Your friends, are we stuck in the past? Some of us are still holding grudges and resentments against people for stuff that happened 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And we say, he's never going to change. Well, brothers, if people can't be transformed by making their minds over, we're saying the truth is a lie. Because that is the heart and soul of being a Christian. The truth transforms lives. And we have to be willing at time to take a deep breath and to admit, well, I guess he's changed. It takes courage to do that. Another thing we have to consider is from time to time, people are used by Jehovah. We don't know why. Brothers, we don't have to know why. All we have to do is submit. Brother may be appointed an elder. We've known him since he was a little kid. And we say, boy, they must not know about him what I know. You know, brothers, we have to take a deep breath and just submit. We just have to deal with it. 
we have to accept the fact that sometimes Jehovah sees something in somebody that we don't see. And apparently, whatever it was, Jehovah saw something in Judah that escapes the Bible account. And he used him as the one through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Brothers, are we critical of the people Jehovah uses? Now, isn't it interesting that Judah's blessings would come in the future? Not yet. In fact, when it finally came around time to pick a king, God did not go to the tribe of Judah. He went to the tribe of Benjamin. It was only later, when David was age 30, that he switched it to the tribe of Judah. Did you notice in the prophecy, he didn't say Judah was a lion. Did you see that? It said a lion cub, Judah is. There's a difference. See, young brothers, we got, we got some good young brothers sitting up here in the front. I have total confidence if these young brothers apply themselves, one of these days they're going to be standing up on the platform instructing you. You may not think it's going to happen anytime soon. It's going to happen sooner than you think. They're going to be like lions. They're going to roar. They're going to be awesome teachers, awesome instructors. But right now they're cubs. Not ready yet. And sometimes, brothers, we think we're ready, but we're really not ready. I met a brother years ago, and uh, I had met him on a speaking assignment. He came to Bethel as a temporary worker, and we spent the day together. In fact, I went to give a public talk. And this man, if there's such a thing as looking like an elder, he looked like an elder. Had the salt and pepper gray hair, you know, the wingtip shoes. He had the whole thing worked out. In fact, when I went to give the talk, the people thought I was the ministerial servant and that he was the elder, for which I'm still upset over that, but that's another, <laughs> that's another story. The brother was very disturbed over the fact that the elders had not appointed him yet. Well, I couldn't understand it myself. I mean, he looked like an elder, sounded like an elder, gave beautiful comments. But you know what? By the end of that day, I said, I know why they haven't appointed this man. He was a lying cub. He was too new in the truth. He didn't know enough. He was rigid. He was hard line. He ran his family like a, a, like a military. Th you should have seen his schedule. 7 o'clock, wake up. 7.15, go and shower. I said, you've got to be kidding me. He, oh, yes, this, this way my wife and I are able to pioneer. Yeah, but the kids, they kind of, <laughs> kind of running them like a military unit. And the brothers felt he needed to wait. You know, waiting is not bad. You know what Lamentations 3.26 says? Good it is that one should wait, even silently, for the salvation of Jehovah. So if our brothers apply themselves and wait, in time these cubs are going to grow up into full-grown lions, they will be a powerful force in the congregation. Blessings come not by vying for privileges, by serving quietly, cultivating the needed qualities, and by waiting. By waiting. Now, the main blessing had been given out. Now, if you were one of the other sons, would you say, well, may as well go home now. All the good stuff's been given out. Nothing left but booby prizes. You know, that's the attitude some of us unwittingly have about blessings. Like that sister who was a regular pioneer. Circumstances changed. She couldn't pioneer anymore. She went from pioneer to irregular publisher. She just felt that she couldn't be a pioneer. She was nothing. We had to explain it doesn't work like that. We get, we get whatever blessings our circumstances permit us to get. But some of us will get in our head, I've got to have this particular privilege, this particular blessing, and if I don't have that, it's the end of the world. I remember speaking with a brother who desperately, desperately wanted to serve as an elder, a highly qualified man as far as knowledge was concerned, speaking ability. And the brothers were holding him back. I didn't know why. He had what appeared to be some legitimate complaints about the way the brothers were dealing with him. Anyway, he took me out to lunch, and we basically both cried through our lunch. He just told me how discouraged he was, how bad he felt, how much he wanted to serve the brothers, how much he had begged the brothers to give him counsel to work on. They wouldn't tell him what he needed to work on. I didn't know what to tell the brother, frankly. I mean, I just sat there crying with the man. I, I didn't know how to encourage him. And, uh, boy, it was the most depressing lunch. And he said, let's go. He says, um... You know what? He says, let me, let me take you to meet my Bible study. I have this wonderful couple I'm studying with. They're both coming to all the meetings. You know what? After we're done with them, I want you to meet this other couple I'm studying with. Wait, wait, hold on. You've got two Bible studies with two married couples that are coming to the hall. Yeah. What's wrong with you? 
What do you mean? What is wrong with you? You have just spent the last hour moaning and groaning that Jehovah isn't using you. And he's letting you bring two couples into the truth. You know there were pioneers that don't have Bible studies like that. Can't you see that Jehovah is blessing you? It may not be the blessing that you want, but he is blessing you. Brothers, we have a lot to learn by looking at some of these minor blessings that are given to Jacob's other sons. Look at Genesis 49, verse 13. Zebulun will reside by the seashore, and he will be by the shore where the ships lie anchored, and his remote side will be towards Sidon. Now, this is not an earth-shaking blessing, but it was a blessing. Sidon was north of Israel, so his tribal inheritance would be towards Sidon. It would be in the northern portion. And when the lot fell, Zebulun received a portion of land, not literally by the seaside, but between the Sea of Galilee on the east and the Mediterranean on the west. And that gave this tribe access to both bodies of water. It was a location that was favorable for trade. Now, particularly favorable was the fact that later on, Jesus spent a lot of his time preaching in that part of Israel. Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 talked about how those people would see a great light. Matthew 4 says that it was fulfilled when Christ preached right there in that area around Galilee where Zebulun was. Apparently, some in the tribe of Zebulun took advantage of their location, of their situation, listened to Jesus, and put faith in him. Now, what is the lesson for us today? Well, when the lot comes out for you, whatever your lot in life is. Do you see the favor in your situation? Or is the glass always half empty? See, a lot of our, what we do is how we view things. I remember my father died suddenly of a heart attack. No warning. I, I never remember my dad being sick. Left my mother seemingly without support. And my wife and I took a leave of absence. We were trying to put this figure out did he have any insurance and so forth and work this out and I thought my dad had some money uh, not much so it was a rather discouraging period of time and I was trying to think of there's got to be a blessing in here somewhere there's got to be something I could say to my mom to let her know that her life is is not going to be dismal and then I realized what it was and we were coming back from an appointment with the insurance agent I said mom you know you know what just occurred to me I said, Jehovah has opened up a new way of life for you. And she said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, Dad was not a witness. And as a result, although he was favorable, he never was much for having people over. My mother was very sociable. She loved to be with people. I said, Mom, you've got a seven-room house. You're within an hour of Bethel. Why not open your home? Now you can have the traveling overseer stay with you. Now people visiting Bethel can stay with you. Uh, it's a blessing. And my mother rethought out her situation. And you know, for the rest of her life, that is what she did. She became Miss Hospitality. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people stayed in that house. In fact, my wife and I have had the privilege of giving talks like this in over 40 out of the 50 continental United States. And it is a rare occasion where somebody in the audience doesn't come up to me and say, you're never going to believe this. I stayed in that house. I was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I don't even know where that is on the map. I stayed in your mother's house. She took that situation. She could have seen it dark and, and pointless. And she said, where's the blessing? Brothers, take a good look at your situation. Do you own a home? That means you can have people over for lunch. You can have the pioneers over for lunch. You've got a microwave oven or some kind of stove. You can have company, even if it's something as simple as a cup of tea. Are you in a position to have a meal for the traveling overseer? Maybe your situation is that you're single. That may not be the, the ideal situation for you, but it does give you mobility. You know, we went, had the privilege of going to one of the international assemblies. And it's amazing, on that bus group of ours were several single sisters who had decided, I am not going to roll over and die. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to travel. I'm going to do things. They're making the most of their situation. Brothers, when we make the most of whatever situation our lot in life is, we put ourselves in line for a blessing. Now we read in Genesis 49, verse 14. Issachar is a strong-boned ass. Now how would you feel 
Judah gets the kingship, Zebulun gets land, and you're told you're a strong-boned ass. Now, you might say, this doesn't sound like a blessing. He's a strong-boned ass, lying down between the two saddlebags, and he will see that the resting place is good, and the land is pleasant, and he will bend down his shoulder to bear burdens, and he will become subject to slavish, forced labor. There's your blessing. How do you like it? How would you react if that was your blessing? It is a blessing. Do you see it? First of all, let's deal with that word ass. Now, it is not an insult. The Insight book says, although the ass's stupidity and stubbornness are proverbial, its intelligence is actually considered to be superior to that of the horse. And it is a patient, long-suffering creature. So his father is saying, look, you've got good qualities. You're like a hard-working animal. You're humble. You're meek. You're willing to work. You're like this animal that has these saddlebags. And when it rests, it doesn't try to shake them off. It sits and it waits and is ready for action. And you know, the history of the Bible tells us that Issachar always was a hard-working tribe. It always did its share. It took on the part of Palestine called the Valley of Jezreel where they did the hard work of farming and supplied food for the nation. Later on when Judges Barak and Tola and even David needed soldiers, the Bible said that Issachar provided its share of soldiers. And when all of the tribes had to contribute to finance Solomon's lavish lifestyle, Issachar is recorded as having done its share. Brothers, there is a lesson in this. Do you know where the blessings come? Blessings come to people who are willing to do slavish, forced labor. People who are willing to labor on behalf of Jehovah. Now, we may not be able to do as much as the next person. Galatians 6.5 says, each one will carry his own load. Now, your load may be different from mine. You may be burdened with health problems, maybe dealing with emotions, who knows. But... Just do what Jehovah has put on your plate. That's all. Deal with what Jehovah has put on your plate. Do your share. And it doesn't have to be gigantic. When an announcement is made, clean the kingdom hall, we drop everything. We do our share. We do our vacuuming and scrubbing. We have a good time doing it. It's slavish labor. When we need people to help build kingdom halls, we need people to prepare meals for traveling overseers, for pioneer school, the people that are willing to do a little bit of slavish forced labor, they are the ones that have the joy. When it comes to the ministry, we should be willing to have our share. Brothers, our share does not have to be outstanding to gain blessings. And at the end of the month, we should be able to say with some satisfaction, you know what, I didn't do as much as I'd like to do, but for my health, for my circumstances, I did my share. That's all we have to do, and Jehovah blesses us. Now, many people don't mind slavish forced labor as long as they get some recognition for it. Now, the real challenge is to be willing to work hard for Jehovah and not get recognition. Would you be willing to do that? Would you willing, be willing to do humble work, not out in front where everybody can see you, but in the back? Look at the next son, Genesis 49:16. Dan will judge his people. That's also a play on words. The word Dan means judge. So he's saying judge will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Let Dan prove to be a serpent by the roadside, a horned snake at the wayside, that bites the heels of the horse so that its rider falls backwards. I shall indeed wait for salvation from you, O Jehovah. Now again, this doesn't sound like a blessing. Poor Issachar was an ass, and now Dan is called the snake, and yet it is a blessing. Now... Dan would judge his people, and one of the outstanding judges of the nation came from this tribe. Do you know who that was? That was Judge Samson, one of the outstanding men of the Bible, came from this tribe. And other Danites would be used prominently. But why did he have to call him a snake? Well, apparently that refers to the horned viper. It's a poisonous snake, and it's only two and a half feet long. Of course, not being a snake lover, for me, that's two and a half feet too long. It's not a gigantic snake, but apparently its venom is powerful, it is potent, and it has been known to attack horses. It could bite the heel of a horse, cause, uh, cause a horse to rear upward and dump its rider. 
little but dangerous. Now, appropriately, during the wilderness trek, Dan was assigned as the rear guard. As the rear guard. Now, that's not a glamorous position. But they got to watch their brother's back. They were at the back. If anybody attacked, they would be the first ones to be engaged in battle. It took courage to be in the back. And this prophecy indicated that although the tribe of Dan would always be relatively small, it would be potent. It would be effective. And what a powerful lesson that is for God's people today. You know what? We may be little, but we're dangerous. We are powerful. We have people sitting in this kingdom hall who are semi-illiterate. And yet, when they go out in the field service and hold the word of God in their hands, they are powerful. They are effective. Because 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful by God. Young people, do you understand the power you can have? We know the pressure you're under. We know the way your teachers are telling you how smart you are, how much money you can make. But you're never really going to find your power as a person until you let Jehovah's Spirit work through you. And when you go out in the field and develop your skills and realize with just a little bit of effort how powerful you can be, then you really see what it's like to serve Jehovah. You know, even our young children, when our young children hold the Bible in their hands, when they know the truth, they're powerful. Let me tell you about nine-year-old Raquel. Nine years old. She says, one day in field service, I was talking about how righteous people will inherit the earth. And the lady I was talking to said, honey, I've been to heaven and back. And she went on and on about how she saw God. Anyway, when she finished, I asked her, well, miss, if, if you saw God and you were in heaven, what in the world did you come back for? She said, yeah, that's a good question. I showed her in the scriptures how no man has seen God at any time. Now, how many of our young people could find the Bible text that says that? Nine-year-old Raquel could. She ran and got her King James Bible. I showed it to her there, too. Now, my mom and I are studying the Bible with her. Do you see what blessings await us if we just go out in the field and let Jehovah's Spirit work with us? Are we willing to serve in the rear, doing that humble, difficult work, knocking on doors, talking to other people, standing up to God's enemies? Maybe you're afraid. You know, I've talked to young people around the world, and you know what universally they admit? They say the scariest thing for them about field service is knocking on a door and having one of their friends from school come to the door petrified of that. Some of them say when they go to the door, if they know a friend lives there, they don't really ring the doorbell. They just pretend to ring the doorbell. You a little fearful? You need to learn from the next son. This actually is one of my favorite sons. It's brief, but it makes a powerful point. As for Gad, a marauder band will raid him. Now, again, this doesn't sound like a blessing. This is kind of like saying, in your blessing, you're going to get mugged. A marauder band will raid him, but he will read the extre- raid the extreme rear. He will raid the extreme rear. What does that mean? Somehow these words don't work well in English. In English, these words seem puzzling, disturbing, but apparently in the ancient Hebrew, those words were inspiring. What do they refer to? Well, when the Jews entered the Promised Land, most of the Jews crossed the Jordan River, and settled west of the Jordan. Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said, we don't want to go. Why? The rest of the Jews were farmers. The tribe of Gad were cattle raisers, and they said, we need a different kind of land. We need grazing land. And the land that would work best for us is the land east of the Jordan, up in Gilead and Bashan. That would work for us. Now, there's a problem with living there. You see, the Jordan River is a natural military barrier. In fact, remember the problem Joshua had getting his people across the river? It actually took a miracle to get them across. And while you're figuring how to cross this river, every Israelite in the world will be on the other side with bows and arrows. So you'd be kind of a sitting duck. So the safest place to be was west of the Jordan. Now, east of the Jordan, there was no natural geographic barrier. In fact, east of Bashan and Gilead is just open plain. And that meant if you lived there, you were a sitting duck. Marauding bands would come in 
from the east and raid you. Now what did Jacob say? He will raid the extreme rear. Do you know what that means? He is saying to his son, fight back. Don't be afraid. Fight back. And you know what they'll do? They're cowards. They're going to run and you'll end up raiding them. You will raid their extreme rear as they run away from you. Brothers, we are exposed to the attacks of Satan's world. How easy it is to give in and get discouraged. A sister recently sent me an email from a brother in Germany. The field is, wherever you go in the world, we're hearing the same thing. You know what the brother said? Friends are missing the meetings because they're tired. They're tired and worn out. Now I ask the question, who in this kingdom hall isn't tired? Now, we're not making light of people's problems. Some of our brothers are dealing with situations that are very, very difficult. But do you get the spirit of what Jacob is saying? Yeah, we're under attack. Satan's trying to wear us out. Now, we have one defense and one defense only. Our defense, fight back. Fight back. How do we fight back? It's these simple tools. We go out in the field service. We come to the meetings. We do our personal study. When we oppose the devil, he flees from us. That is Jesus, or James is a promise. Suppose the devil, he will flee from you. When the pressures of the world attack us, the best defense is a good offense. I have a friend of mine, a sister, that's been dealing with the depression for quite a while. She went through a period of time where it was very difficult for her to come to the meetings. But this dear sister fought back. You know what she would do? On some evenings, she would pull her car up to the King Hall and she couldn't get out. And she'd sit in the car trembling. And she would pull her car up to the door, and they'd open the door, and she'd roll down her windows. And she'd listen to as much of the meeting, the sound that came out through the doors of the windows. She'd listen to as much as she could. And she'd sit there with tears rolling down her eyes. But she would do everything physically possible to be at the meetings. And then, with treatment, and with time, and patience, her situation has improved. Now she's able to go to the meetings, and her husband, who was not really able to serve as a pointed brother for a long time because of the situation of his wife, he supported her, helped her, and it was very thrilling to me just a couple of weeks ago to get an email from the brother to find out he had just been appointed an elder, and that his wife was doing good, she was making all the meetings, and she was going out in field service. It was hard, but she showed the power of fighting back. Now, Asher and Naphtali both received favorable mention. And the time came to give the blessing to his favorite son. Now, kids, does that kind of get to you? Favorite son. I always knew mom liked you best. You know, I, I think my sister and I have been arguing about this for the last 50 years. You know, these things just go on and on and on. And the fact of the matter is, parents, sometimes we do have favorites. Now, it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It's just that sometimes you have more of an affinity for one child than to another. Uh, maybe this child looks like you. Now, you love all your kids, but this one looks like you. You can't help it. <laughs> you just feel a certain affinity. Or, or maybe you have more in common. Maybe you're a sports fan, and you've got a son that can kick back and watch a ball game with you, and you feel this affinity. The other son, you love him, but he's a kind of a poet. And you sit there, boy, where did he get that from? And you, you love him, but... It's a little harder for you to relate to him. And sometimes you, you do have certain kids that you draw close to. Now that in itself is not necessarily wrong. So you can kind of get rid of that burden of guilt. Feeling close to one child is not necessarily wrong. The real issue is not whether you have a favorite. The issue is whether you are guilty of favoritism. Favoritism in any form is an abuse of power. The real issue is, do I give each and every one of my children what they individually need? And kids, if you're going through this and you're saying, I don't know, Dad's always spending time with her, wish she'd spend that time with me. Okay, it, it may be favoritism, it may be, but you know, it may be that sibling of yours has a problem you don't know about. And maybe mom and dad have singled that child out and says, he or she needs extra attention right now. This doesn't mean they don't love you. They're just dealing with the situation. Well, now we come to this favorite son, and what a lesson for parents. Did you notice that Judah 
did not give in to sentiment and go to his favorite son first. He made him wait his turn. There's a lesson in parenting. He made him wait his turn. And there he says in Genesis 49, 22, offshoot of a fruit-bearing tree. Now, we've got to figure this out. Who's the fruit-bearing tree? That would be Jacob himself. He had 12 sons. Joseph is the offshoot of a fruit-bearing tree by the fountain, so it had a good source, it was a healthy tree, that propels its branches up over a wall. So apparently, Jacob had had 12 prominent sons, but apparently, Judah's branch was higher than all the others. It stood out. He was the most prominent. Now, brothers, let me warn you. If you stand out a little bit above the herd, maybe you're an outstanding teacher, an outstanding preacher, maybe you're outstandingly well off financially. If your head is a little higher than the rest of the herd, you may become the target of jealousy. That's what happened to Joseph. What does it say? But the archers kept harassing him and shot at him and kept harboring animosity against him. Now, who were the archers? Were they the Canaanites? The Egyptians? No. It was his brothers. His brothers who were jealous and couldn't stand the fact that he was a favorite. So what did they do? They sold him into slavery. Now, how did Joseph react when his brothers mistreated him? Did he lose it? Did he become angry and, and vindictive? No, it says, yet his bow was dwelling in a permanent place and the strength of his hands was supple. Let me warn you, brothers. I've been, well, depending on how you count it, I've been an elder officially under the elder arrangement for almost 30 years. And in my nearly 30 years of serving as an elder, I can only remember twice, twice, somebody approaching me about a problem involving somebody on the job. I've, twice I've had somebody come to me in tears. I get this person on the job that's really giving me a hard time. Most of the time, though, you just deal with it. You don't go to the elders over that stuff. You deal with it. Probably most of you sitting out there have somebody difficult on your job. You've never mentioned it to one of the elders. You, you deal with it. Your most painful trials are going to come not from the world. Your most painful trials may come from right within the congregation. Brothers who can go out in the working world and take all kinds of knocks and hits and still come to the kingdom hall smiling, but let a brother or sister act with animosity, and we don't have a defense for that. It, it cuts us to the heart. It's devastating. Now, did you notice that Joseph was not helpless? It said his bow was dwelling in a permanent place. Or as the Jewish Tanakh version says, his bow stayed taut. In other words, he had a weapon. And apparently, if, if Joseph used that weapon, if he fired any arrows, they were arrows of love, arrows of kindness. Joseph did not return evil for evil. He returned hatred with love. Notice, too, that Joseph was not weakened by his years in prison. It said the strength of his hands was supple. After all those trials, being thrown into prison, being arrested, at the end of it all, he was strong. Now, brothers, I used to think that the real issue was surviving a trial. I don't think that anymore. I don't know if you have marathons down in Florida, but we have the Boston Marathon, we have the New York Marathon. You've seen them on television. Once a year, people decide they want to run 25 miles. I don't know why they want to do this, but they do it. And when they cross the finish line, do you know what's there? Paramedics. Ambulances, right? They scoop these people up, put them on an IV. Right? They made it, right? But they're, they're just about dead. And that's what happens to some of us with a trial. I mean, we, it's not that we fall out the truth, but it's like somebody has taken the air out of us. We're deflated. We're so hurt. We're so stumbled. The real issue is not whether we simply get through a trial. The real issue is do you come out of the trial weak or do you come out strong? That's really the issue. You see, all of our elders from the governing body on down are imperfect men. And from time to time, some of us are going to run into that imperfection. 
I remember years ago, um, this may sound egotistical, but it made sense at the time. I was extremely upset that I was not appointed congregation elder. I was 22 years old. Now, you might say, what kind of egotistical man thinks he should have been an elder at age 22? Well, it was different back in those days. I came up under the old arrangement. Uh, they started giving me service meeting parts when I was 17. I was a book study conductor at age 17. I was giving public talks at age 18. Age 19, I was theocratic school servant. So by the time I was 22, I was at Bethel. I'd been there a couple of years, right? So I felt I qualified. And uh, the brothers not only didn't feel, <laughs> they not only felt I didn't qualify, but they felt I needed to be held back. And so I no longer gave public talks. I no longer was allowed to give instruction talks. In fact, I remember the day where I went from being theocratic ministry school servant. I was asked to hand over all those records. And then they handed me back a stack of reminder slips and said, your job is now to pass these slips out. Now, I wish I could tell you, brothers, that I said, thank you, brothers, and went about my job happily. But I've got to tell you, I was so hurt. It got me passing out these things. I'm qualified to conduct it. I'm more qualified than that brother standing up there. I had some problems with the accounts, with handling the money, and we got into a big thing over missing money, and I felt the money should be handled this way, and one of the brothers felt it should be handled that way. Bottom line, it was announced to the congregation that there was about $70 missing. Back in the early 70s, $70 was a lot of money. $70 is missing due to inaccurate record-keeping on the part of the literature sir, People literally turned around and looked at me like I was a criminal. <laughs> One sister came up to me and she said to me, you know, some of us sisters here are on welfare and you're just throwing our money away. <laughs> you see how we're all laughing about this? Wasn't funny 30 years ago. <laughs> Wasn't funny at all. I was, I was very, very bent out of shape. I went to an elder. A brother was like a father to me and one of my mentors. And he said, well, Lee... Jehovah's molding you. Jehovah's training you. Okay. I don't mind being molded for a year. Next year came, I expected an appointment. Didn't come. Next year, I expected an appointment. and didn't come. Following year, they said, we have two appointments from the society. I said, well, great, me and somebody else. Good for him, whoever it is. When they read those two names, and neither name was mine, friends, I just about lost it. I was, I was in such a rage. All I could think, I'm getting out of this congregation. If, if I have to leave Bethel, I'm getting out of here. These brothers are not doing me right. And I went back to that wise brother, and he said, You know, well, Lee, Jehovah's molding. I, I'm sick of hearing about this molding thing. You know, I, I don't want Jehovah to mold me. I just want to be an elder. I'm sick of this. And the brother said, Do you know what your problem is? You're not responding to the molding. You know, I've never forgotten that. And I have learned since then, when, when I keep getting the same problem over and over and over again, I keep getting smacked in the face, because I'm not getting the point. I'm not making the changes I need to make. Brothers, it was a discipline. And I had to come through that, not all weak and discouraged. I had to learn to change my thinking and to get my joy back. Now, brothers, please ex excuse my attempt to do an island accent, but it is part of the story, so please no offense here. But I want to read a story about a brother with a good attitude. He was a brother from Barbados. He was presiding overseer. He received a letter from the branch with no explanation removing him. One discontented one to try to stir up contention by, by saying, What happened? Why they removed you, man? What you going to do about it? The brother responded, look, man, this ain't nothing to talk about. Now listen to his explanation. He says, when the society appoints a person to a post in the congregation, they don't tell you they're going to appoint you. You know, he's right. They don't tell you they're going to appoint you. So when they remove you, you don't make a fuss. You carry on as usual. There is a man who had his head screwed on right. Brothers, privileges, believe me, privileges come and go. The biggest privilege in this organization is to be a publisher of the good news. Everything else is gravy. You get to give talks, wonderful. But the biggest privilege is to be a part of the congregation. Privileges come and go. And when we get privileges or privileges are taken away or we're not in a position to enjoy certain blessings, don't let those trials weaken you spiritually. Or brothers, if you feel you are the victim of mistreatment, to feel that brothers are jealous of you. 
Brother, just quietly serve Jehovah and have faith that in His due time, the judge of all the earth will set matters straight and bless you for waiting. Genesis 49, 24, and 25 indicate that because Joseph waited, at the end of verse 25, he says, Blessings will come to be upon the head of Joseph, upon the crown of the one singled out from his brothers. Now, he didn't receive the blessing he thought he'd get, the kingship, the priesthood, but he was blessed with two tribes, Ephraim and, Ephraim and Manasseh came from Joseph, so he did get the twofold blessing of the firstborn. After the blessing of Benjamin, a hush fell over the room. Some of those sons were no doubt licking their wounds, hanging their heads in shame. Some that had received blessings felt good. But as the quietness became heavy, they realized they were standing at the deathbed of their father. It was a somber moment. And although death is unnatural, although death is our enemy, Jacob was not afraid to face it. Now, do you, ever, do you ever ask yourself if you're afraid to die? Do you ever wonder how you'd be if you knew you were going to die? Jacob was not afraid to die. And do you know why? Number one, Jacob had lived a life of integrity and devotion to Jehovah. He always put spiritual things first. And brothers, if you do that, you can die with the total confidence that Jehovah won't forget you. Number two, Jacob could die peacefully because he had put all his affairs in order. He had fulfilled his fatherly duty to leave his children both a spiritual and material legacy. Parents are your affairs in order. Family heads, if you were to die tonight, does your wife know where your life insurance is? Do you have life insurance? Do you have a will? Does your wife know where the will is? Do you know why I am standing up here this evening? I am able to be at Bethel and serve you brothers because my father, who was not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, had the good sense to leave a will and to leave some insurance. And we were able to arrange things that my mother was able to pioneer up until the day of her death. Yet I have met families that were absolutely devastated by the death of the father who thought Jehovah's Witnesses live forever. We will in the new world. <laughs> but right now, brothers, we have a responsibility. and We want to make sure our affairs are in order. Far more importantly, are our spiritual affairs in order? Brothers, if you were to die this evening, do you have the confidence that your children will keep serving Jehovah because you've done everything you could to teach them Jehovah's ways? Point number three. Jacob had settled accounts. There were no more loose ends. He had settled it with all of his sons. Brothers, do we have loose ends? Is there somebody in this kingdom hall we need to have a talk with? I mean, is there somebody in this hall we need to have a talk with? I had served a congregation in Cleveland, Ohio, and I met a little girl I became very fond of. And uh, I used to enjoy when i go back, she'd be the first one to come up to me. And I gave this talk, and after the talk, she didn't come up to me. Where is she? When she came up later, she says, Brother Waters, I had to take one of my girlfriends in the back and settle accounts with her because we weren't talking to each other. I said, this isn't right. Jehovah doesn't like this. We used to be friends. She was about 10 years old. Out of the mouth of babes. If there's somebody that we have loose ends with, some old resentments, you know, a good time to settle it? Tonight, this very evening. For one last time, Jacob looks at his sons, and no doubt his eyes showed deep affection even for the sons that so deeply disappointed him. But he won't die yet. He has one more task, one more final admonition. He adds a codicil to his will. In verse 29 it says, After that he commanded them and said to them, I am being gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah. Now why did he care where he was going to be buried? Why would he make them drag his bones hundreds of miles from Egypt all the way up to the cave of Machpelah? It was an object lesson. He knew his family was in Egypt. And they were going to be there for a long time. The danger was that they would be assimilated into Egyptian culture. Jacob had faith that in due time, God would return his people to the promised land. And he wanted to remind them that this was not their home. Their real home, their inheritance, their birthright. 
was the land of Canaan. So he said, don't bury me here. Bury me in the cave of Machpelah. Never forget where your real home is. Too exhausted to speak anymore, we read in Genesis forty-nine thirty-three that he gathered his feet up onto the couch and expired and was gathered to his people. You know, sometimes people try to keep a stiff upper lip when somebody that they love dies. I don't know how healthy that is. Joseph sure didn't keep a stiff upper lip. According to Genesis chapter 50, absolutely unashamed of his tears, Joseph fell upon the face of his father and burst into tears over him and kissed him. Jacob was dead. But his will would survive him. And only now are its assets being distributed. Jehovah makes it possible for all of us to receive blessings. What have we learned from this will? We have learned that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And sooner or later we will be held accountable for what we've said and for what we've done. And whether we receive a curse or a blessing depends upon us, depends upon you, depends upon me. Now, what do we need to do to get these blessings? A few weeks ago, I spoke to another sister that's dealing with depression. And the sister had managed through great effort to finally go out in field service. And she, it was like a victory for her. She called me up and she was so proud. And I said, well, that's so good. And I look forward to you going out again. She says, oh, it's so hard. It's just so difficult. I, I understand that. But that's, that's what Jehovah wants you to do. And I refer to Psalm 126, which talks of how some of us may have to sow with tears. And it's, it's just very difficult. But if you want Jehovah's blessing, you have to really put forth effort. And she says, well, yeah, I know, but it's so hard. It's so difficult. So finally I said, well, all right, let me ask you this. What if you were walking down the street and a man grabbed you and dragged you into an alley to rape and kill you? And would you say, you know what? I'm so tired. You know what? Just do whatever you have to do. She said, no way. I fight. That's right, you'd fight. You'd scream, you'd scratch, you'd claw because you are fighting for your life. Now you need to fight for your spiritual life. You need to fight for these blessings. You need to scream and scratch and claw. Brothers, we put forth the effort. Jehovah will bless us. Jacob's will is a beacon of hope. It reminds us that this is not our home. We stand on the border of a promised land, a righteous new world, and right now we suffer, we toil. But we must never allow Satan to lull us into a life of pleasure seeking. We must never forget that it is the blessing of Jehovah. That is what makes rich. Jehovah has given us his promise that an inheritance awaits us in the new world. Brothers, stake your claim for a piece of paradise. Picture yourself there. Think about being there. Dream about being there. Fight for your life to get there. It is your home. It is your birthright. Do not let anyone or anything take it away from you. Keep a clean standing before Jehovah so that when the time comes, you too will be counted worthy of rich, abundant, and eternal blessings.